The other thing I've challenged is, is, is this actually sense of planning. I think we've, we, again, it's this notion of kind of long-term strategic planning. Um, the management consultants have grown fat on this for the last 15, 20 years. Personally, I think, again, a lot of it is quite bogus science. And again, I think we need to challenge the whole orthodoxy of, of strategic planning, what we mean by planning. Uh, just a simple question, actually. Um, there's a study done um, by Harvard. They looked at the top 100 fastest growing companies uh, in America. Okay. Um, how many of these companies um, actually write a full business plan? 28%. Well, that's kind of, that's kind of mad. That's the first, the first thing you do is to write a business plan. That, that's kind of law number one of developing a business. You write a business plan. But for whatever reason, 72% of the fastest growing businesses, you know what, we're not writing a full business plan. This isn't the way we operate. I thought it was quite an interesting kind of statistic in a sense of kind of how things are working. But then I remember talking to, again, someone in the social media space said, look, even Procter & Gamble, who are pretty smart, still work to an 18-month planning cycle. Okay, that's fairly normal. Do you know where Twitter went from zero to global in nine months? So how the hell can an 18-month cycle even accommodate the pace of change in the kind of markets we're in? You know, and what we're seeing now, I think, is a move, a lot of businesses, to what I call real-time planning. This less of a fixation with long-term fixed, almost Stalinist plans. So you know what? We need to be much more pragmatic. Do things as we go along. Respond to particular needs. You know, much more faster moving. Okay, and more empowering, less decisions made at the centre, more decisions made locally. The sense of responding to situations as they come along, rather than trying to sit there and anticipate a hyper-dynamic changing world, which we'll never anticipate. It's, again, it's this bogus sense of illu this illusion of certainty. If I write it down in a fixed plan, it will be so. It gives you the sense that you can control your destiny. You know, and again, looking at a market like Ireland, you know, the next few years are going to be tough and volatile and fast-moving, Sitting down here today, I don't think anybody in this room can write with any confidence a long-term plan. You've got to work in a much more pragmatic sense if you're going to thrive in this market. And the good news is a lot of businesses out there all over the world are starting to do this. You know, Real-time planning, I think, is definitely the way we're going to go. It may put some management consultants out of work, but there's also some benefits. Uh, the other thing I think is the role of agencies. There are a few agencies in the room. This is, this is the bit where the agencies start hiding under the table. Um, <laughs> I've worked in agencies, agencies for 20 odd years, so hopefully I, I can speak with some, some sense of what's kind of going on. But I can, again, I think it's a really interesting time to challenge the role of your agencies and how you use your agencies. Um, and there is a, set, a sense, actually, the current, again, the current model doesn't work. You know, we've been talking about media neutrality for a long, long time. That doesn't, doesn't work. You know, and so many clients are really, really frustrated with their agencies. And to be honest, most people in agencies are really frustrated with their clients. It's kind of like a bad marriage isn't really going anywhere, we need to kind of find a new way of reframing it. Because it's not working for either side. You know, both sides are kind of struggling, struggling with this. There's a definite sense that actually cost will be the change driver here. Um, consistently, we're hearing, hearing the sense of tw at least 20% needs to be taken out of the budget. Okay, so if nothing else, the need to save money will force some change. You know, and it will wean clients off this madness where they've gone out and hired multiple executional specialists. I work with some clients who've got 90 different agencies just in the UK. How the hell do you manage 90 agencies? You know, how do you even find a piece of paper big enough to put them all on? It's just complete, complete madness. But there's a real kind of sense now that cost will be the change driver here. You know, cost will force companies and agencies to rethink how they're working together as, as businesses. So I think you know, what we're going to start seeing... An end to this madness of specialisation. You know, we've gone from a situation 20 years ago with one big monolithic agency now to multiple agencies. Done for the right reasons, and we do need specialist skills, but you know what? It's too expensive. It's too bureaucratic. It's too slow. It's a nightmare to manage, and it's woefully incoherent. And what we'll start seeing, and we are starting to see what I've called an intelligent bundling of capabilities. Not one-stop shopping, but a sense now that clients say, you know what, I don't want to have eight different agencies in the digital space. You know, I don't want to have a separate direct marketing agency in the ad agency. I want intelligent bundling where it makes sense. And agencies that are capable of, of providing intelligent bundles will clean up and are starting to do so, which is kind of in interesting. We're going to start seeing some new hybrids. Uh, I think one interesting space that I'm seeing emerging is this whole PR social media hybrid. Um, social media could be the thing that pushes the PR industry to the top table, finally after many, many years, if it gets its act together. 
there, there is definitely an interesting emerging hybrid here because the skills are applicable, you know, and the skills make sense. And, and this, again, this is a more interesting development. Um, another thing and it's fascinating is, is actually people exploring alternative creative solutions. And again, to point to something that Unilever are doing, um, this is the Pepperami animal. Okay, this is a 20-plus-year-old advertising icon, um, which is the core of the brand. Um, early this year, Unilever did quite a bold step in a way. They fired their agency of 20 odd years, the agency that created the animal, and said, "You know what? Actually, we are going to put the brief out to the open market." Now, the press presented this as, as, as crowdsourcing, and even Unilever said, you know, somebody sitting in, a, you know, in, in, their, in their bedroom in Durham could crack this brief. In actuality, that was not their target. They deliberately went and targeted the freelance creative community all over the world and said, Here, here's a creative brief. It's an existing property. You go and develop the work. They've had over 1,000 creative pitches back to them which they're now managing through, and the work is going to be running in the next month. And Unilever are so happy with it, they're talking about introducing it for, the, for the other brands. Outsourcing their creative work to the open market. It's a very brave step, but it's a very interesting kind of step in terms of how they are thinking. You know, they've recognized that, you know what, we don't need expensive agency infrastructure to develop existing properties. You know, they're working with existing concepts. So again, I think we can see a lot more of this type of experimentation. Rethinking how do we develop creativity. There's a wealth of talent out there in the market. And creativity has become democratized. You know, some bright person with an Apple Mac sitting in their bedroom can create fantastic concepts. And we can see much more of this kind of fresh thinking. And, 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 and it's a real challenge for agencies in terms of redefining their role. It doesn't mean they'll disappear. You know, somebody had to originate the concept in the first place. <coughs> What it means is that agencies that have made their money at simply repackaging, repurposing work that was developed 20 years ago are going to struggle. Yeah. So it's going to be a tough, tough call for them. I think the other challenge we're going to start seeing is this whole notion of branding. Again, we've had, sort of, we've had, a, we've, we've had 20 years of a culture developing all about the celebrating the, the disciplined art of brand management and brand identity and brand. And a lot of money has been spent, a lot of business has been based on the whole brand strategy business. Okay, and this whole reverence for kind of brand. Um, and my contention is actually in this new world, particularly in this new world of you know, subversive, hyper-connected, collaborative consumer behavior, it doesn't, that model doesn't kind of seem to work anymore. Uh, John Grant, who spoke at last year's conference, um, this is actually a book he wrote 10 years ago. Again, he was somebody very ahead of his time. But in, it, in a sense, he, you know, I think he, I, I like this as a sense of saying, you know, the, even, the, even the term brand feels fixed. It feels very fixed, very set in time. You put your brand on something and you kind of walk away. You know, and that's not how things work in the kind of real market. As you saw with, you know, with, 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 the, with the Microsoft and McDonald's uh, Google image stuff. You know. Brands can't sit there and be preserved and fixed and, 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 and safe in that sort of sense. Um, and again, this sense of this illusion of certainty. You know, I, I have to train this stuff, so feel sorry for me. But you know, brand keys, brand onions, brand whatevers are a complete bogus piece of science. It's this pseudo-intellectualization of brand. This idea that we've put enough bright people in a room with very big brains that they can intellectualize about the brand and crack the brand. You know, and then they can define it and it sits there and it's set and it's perfect. And they can charge a lot of money for doing that. And again, I just don't think that kind of that model work works anymore. The main reason is actually that the sense of brand ownership is shared. Um, the world's most popular tattoo is mum. Okay, what's the world's second most popular tattoo? Any guesses? It's a brand. Harley Davidson. There you go. So I've had a prize. Free Harleys and they come in and drive it. Okay. You know, Harley Davidson. Okay. Now, if you talk to Harley Davidson owners, they believe they own a piece of that brand. And if you talk to the people who run Harley Davidson, there's a real sense that they share ownership of that brand. You know, the old cliche brands old own trademarks, consumers own brands. It's true when it comes to Harley Davidson. You know, and there are equally, you can look at brands like Nike. There are, you know, there are brands where people have a real deep emotional connection with. They, have a, they feel they own a piece of that brand. They feel they need, to, they need to be involved in that whole process. We need to be much more, much more collaborative to kind of win them. And this, I thought, was kind of, this to me is a really interesting symbol of what's happening out there. This is brilliant and completely insane. Okay. Google are breaking every single rule of branding here. Okay, and I talked to the Google guys, and they admit this happened by accident. This started happening kind of organically. They didn't plan this. 
people started doing things with a logo linked to topical events. It spread and spread and spread. There are now websites devoted to Google logos. But this is complete madness. You don't do this, but it's brilliant. Because it's this sense now that a brand is a wonderfully malleable thing that you can play with. Okay, we'll try any, any IP lawyer in the room. I, I did a speech at an IP conference the other week, and they were all kind of shaking in their boots about this one, because this is terrifying. This is not what you do to brands. But this is the new world in which we live, a much more malleable, fluid sense of what a brand is, and a willingness to challenge convention. Why is it that we can't do this to our brand? Let's challenge this. And I think, again, it's this, this spirit of, kind of shaking things up. The second piece of winning behaviour is about trusting the people. Okay, I talked, I said at the start, we're in, we have a real trust deficit. Nobody trusts anybody anymore. We have to find a way to, to, to trust the people. You know, and for a business, it's both your employees and your customers. You've got to find a way to kind of trust them. Um, and this is, I think, a great example of how trust is contagious. Um, this is Wells Fargo, Wachovia Bank in America. Now, one of the biggest problems, nobody trusts the banks anywhere in the world, period. As I said, one of the classic pieces of behavior you see from... Um, when, when people are under pressure is they come in on themselves. Tight message control. So what you're seeing all over the world is banks deploying tight message control. Nothing comes out of the organization unless the chief exec has been through it 88 times. You know, HSBC, which is a great institution, but the only person who seems to talk on HSBC is their chief executive. Nobody else talks about it because we can't risk anybody saying anything stupid. Okay, tight, tight message control. The trouble is, nobody trusts the guys in the pinstripe suits. So it's completely counterproductive. You know, it's a model that doesn't work. Wells Fargo have gone the completely other way. They have put their employees in touch with their customers. It's quite simple. Okay, you go onto the Wells Fargo blog, there are real people who work for the bank in particular areas who will talk to you. And what's interesting is if you say to people, people say, I don't trust, I don't trust the, the person who runs... Lloyd's TSB, but that nice lady who talked to me about my mortgage, I trust her, and that nice man, man who helped me with my pension, he was a nice person, I trust him. People, tr people trust people within the organisation, just not at the top. So this is an organisation that have, you know, have trusted their employees to have a direct relationship with their customers, and that has rebuilt trust in their institution. Trust is wonderfully contagious. Now, when I show this to a lot of banks, they kind of go, yeah, this is good, yeah, but... This is, you know, this is really risky. And I say, okay, when I walk into a branch and I start talking to somebody in the branch, you don't mind me having a conversation with them. What's the difference? The difference actually is you can actually see what's going on here. You've got no idea what they're saying to me in the branch. Trust your employees. You know, and I mentioned when we came last year, you know, there are, Microsoft have 6,000 people who blog about the business. None of them are trained. Okay? They're given some broad guidelines and said, you are ambassadors for the company. You talk about the business, and you talk to people, and we're not, going to, we're not even going to attempt, how can you even attempt to approve, to control 6,000 people? Sun Microsystems have 6,500 bloggers talk about the business. Again, legal department is kept well out of the way, because they trust their employees, and this is why those businesses are, are rebuilding themselves. 